Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. My name is Brian Marvel. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So have you ever been in a situation or a scenario where you desperately wanted to be released from whatever you were experiencing? Thinking to yourself, if, if I could get out of this thing right now, it would save me a whole world of trouble. Anybody ever been there before? For me, it was my senior year in high school, my senior basketball season. Uh, I grew up playing basketball, loved basketball, desperately wanted to be Michael Jordan, always was playing basketball. By the time I got to high school, I, I was a fairly diff- decent basketball player, always going to camps, always going to clinics. And so I was super excited for my senior year because my junior year, I didn't get a whole lot of playing time, which was okay because I was sitting behind other guys who were seniors. So entering into my senior year, I thought this was my opportunity. This was my chance. And as the season got started, I found that I was getting zero playing time and I was sitting the bench. I was like, this is really weird. This is really odd. Specifically because the coach who was coaching us was also my JV coach. He had moved up with us, and I had played a fair amount under him when I was a sophomore. But by the time now I'm a senior, I'm sitting the bench, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is going on? And even one point during the, the season, I went to my coach, and I asked him, hey, why am I not getting a whole lot of playing time? And he gave me a horrible answer. He said, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, well, that's not getting me any playing time. <laughs> I said, just keep doing what you're doing. We'll find some time to get you in. And as the season went on, it was just horrible. And then his like courtside manner started to get really inappropriate and explosive and angry. And I had, I mean, I had a front row seat to that because I was just sitting on the bench all season long. And like other students started to talk about his behavior. Parents were talking about his behavior. My dad even wrote a letter to the athletic director. And like my dad doesn't do those sorts of things typically. And it was just like this complete disappointment. And about halfway through the season, I was like, I'm so ready to be done with basketball. So we get to the end of the year. It's the last game. We have to go to the school an hour and a half away. We play the game. We lose the game. I don't care. We drive home from the game, and I'm feeling this great sense of relief. I'm like, it's done. It's over. It's behind me. I walk in the door when I get home, and my mom and dad are there. They're like, hey, how you doing? And, and they knew how I was feeling about basketball. Like, how you feeling? You doing okay? I'm like, yes, I'm so glad the season is over. And they said, well, I'm like, what do you mean, well? So the, the athletic director called, and they said, you have one more game. I'm like, what do you mean we have one more game? The season is over. They said, you are tied for the last place in the playoffs, and you have to go play a playoff game to see if you get into the playoff. And I'm like, oh, that means if we keep winning, I have to keep playing. Fortunately, we lost that game, and I was done. But it accentuates the fact that sometimes we find ourselves in places and situations where like, I just want to be released from this thing. Maybe it's a job that's a horrible job for you, or it's a class that's really boring, or a conversation and an interaction with another individual. Have you ever been in those? You're like, somebody rescue me from this conversation. Right? Earlier this week, I was having a conversation with somebody about their cat, Mr. Snuggles. And they told me everything about Mr. Snuggles. The little pole he climbs on, the way he likes to scratch it, his favorite toy with the like, stick, with the string, and a fuzzy ball. And when you get the laser pointer out, oh, Mr. Snuggles goes crazy. They even dress Mr. Snuggles up in a pirate costume for Halloween, right? And I'm like, please, somebody get me out of this conversation, right? Anybody ever been in one of those? So, but it raises the question, like if we have these moments in these situations where we want to be set free from something, what really is freedom? Like what does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be set free? Have you ever thought of that? Oftentimes, we define freedom as autonomy. We define freedom as like, hey, I can do whatever I want. And freedom is a huge value in our culture, right? We live in what's called the land of the free. And typically, we define freedom as autonomy, and the mantra of freedom is, I do what I want. I can do what I want. And the story in our culture is that we fought really hard to secure our freedom, and we're continually still fighting for it every day. But is that what freedom is? 
Like, is freedom really autonomy, the ability to do whatever you want? If so, are you free? Because I will tell you, like, I have to do all sorts of things in life that I don't want to do, right? There's all sorts of situations where I'm stuck doing things I don't want to do. I love being a parent, but there are days parenting is really hard, and I would rather not parent, right? Like, I love being a pastor. It's the greatest joy of my life. But there are days I don't want to sit down and write a sermon because I just don't have anything creatively working through me. Like, there are times when I have to do things I don't want to do. So is freedom really having the ability to do whatever you want? What does it mean to be free from a biblical vantage point? Because in the Bible, freedom is a huge theme. Jesus says in John 8, know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. So what does it mean to be free? That's what we're going to take a look at this morning as we jump into the last part of Romans 6. And this is how our passage today begins. This is Romans 6, verse 15. Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but... Under grace, by no means. Now, if you're paying attention as we read through chapter 6, you will notice that this is the second time that Paul has asked this question. The first time was in verse 1 of chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Now, it's worded a little bit differently, but basically it's the same question. And what Paul is doing with this question is he's confronting what he thinks might be a faulty mindset developing in the Christians in Rome. Again, he's circling around the theme of God's grace, and he's saying that it's God's grace that saves you. It's not your moral effort. It's not your spiritual competence. It's not your own sense of righteousness, but it's God's grace that saves you, right? Therefore, salvation is offered to anyone because if grace is always greater than sin, no matter how bad it is, anyone has the capacity to receive salvation because grace is always greater, which means the nature of grace is that it's always abounding, It's always increasing. It's never diminishing. So with Paul's question in verse 15, he's using it as a rhetorical question, right? He answers his own question, and he's doing this to anticipate an attitude that might be developing in the Christians who are listening to this letter, thinking if grace always increases, if grace always is abounding, and it's always greater than sin, then I am free to do whatever I want, right? And he's saying, no, that's not how grace works. That's not what grace is all about. That would be thinking of grace as permission, but grace isn't permission to do whatever you want and live however you want. Grace is power. It's power for salvation. It's power for sanctification. Grace isn't permission, but grace is power. Nor would he say that the mindset if I'm free to do whatever I want, is actually true freedom. He says that's actually just another subversive form of slavery. This is what he says in verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience which leads to righteousness. Now, what Paul is doing in verse 16 is he is framing the reality of freedom in its proper context, meaning true freedom isn't, well, I'm free to do whatever I want. I can live how I please. I can do whatever feels right to me. He says true freedom happens in a certain context, specifically the context for how God created humanity. Paul is calling on a foundational principle that is true for everyone because it's hardwired into creation. And it's a principle that was reframed by the great American prophet, Bob Dylan. (laughs) When he wrote his song, Gotta Serve Somebody, right? 
Anybody familiar with this song? If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, probably. Right, great song. Wrote it in 1979. Won a Grammy for this song. And the song is a brilliant song. Basically, the nature of the song is he lists all sorts of different types of people all throughout our country. He says, you might be an ambassador to England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might, have a social, you might be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But the chorus is, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, you're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Another verse is, you might be a construction worker working on a home. You might live in a mansion. You might live in a dome. You might own guns and you might even own tanks. You might be somebody's landlord. You might even own banks. But you got to serve somebody. See, the way that we were created was we were created to live in full surrender to a force or a source outside of ourself that is greater than ourself. And it was intended to be God. And he's basically saying in this song, no matter who you are, no matter how much power and clout you have, You're going to have to serve somebody because there's always somebody who is more powerful and greater than you. And what Paul is saying in verse 16 is that it's this universal principle that's true for everybody. And either we're going to serve sin or we're going to serve, here he says, obedience. In three ways he will reframe that in this passage. We will either serve sin or we will serve obedience. Another place he will say righteousness another place he will say, God. We either serve sin or obedience, righteousness, or God. And if you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, you see it there. God creates humanity. He creates Adam and Eve. He puts them in the garden, and he says, you can do anything you want. You can go anywhere you want. You can eat of any tree you want except for one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat of that tree. And then along comes a serpent, and they get them to question and doubt and wonder whether or not what God said is true, and so now they have a choice. Who are they going to serve? Who are they going to obey? Are they going to obey the Lord or the serpent? And ever since then, humanity has been in that wrestle. Humanity has been in that tension. Are we going to serve the Lord or are we going to serve sin? Because Adam and Eve fell into sin, sin enters the world at that point, which breaks, distorts, fractures God's design for the world. And ever since then, Paul says in chapter 5, that death came into the world through sin. Sin and death came through Adam. We were all born into a world that is riddled with sin, and so we live in this struggle. And so that means freedom in this context, in its proper context, freedom is not, I can do whatever I want. But freedom is about living into the design for which God created you. It's living into the intention for which God designed your life. To live in close relationship to Him, to live in full surrender to Him, to live in participation with His mission in the world. Anybody here remember the show Mythbusters? It was on whatever, the History Channel or whatever, these two guys who were special effects experts who would test all of these crazy myths in the world. Like if you're standing on the top of the Empire State Building and you drop a penny down to the ground and it hits somebody, it could kill them, right? You heard that somewhere along the way? So they put things like that to the test. You've probably seen uh, scenes in a movie where somebody's singing really loud, really high pitch, and it breaks glass. And so they put that to the test. Can you actually break glass with a loud, high-pitched sound, they came across this thought that they heard somewhere that you can cook a lasagna in a dishwasher. Anybody see this episode? <laughs> and so th- they put it to the test. They see, can, can it, because a dishwasher heats up water, can you actually cook a lasagna in a dishwasher? They found that you can. Now, if I invite you over to dinner <laughs> and I say, hey, guess what? we're having lasagna, and you come to my house, and you walk into the kitchen, and you don't smell lasagna, and you notice the oven is not on, and you're wondering, where's the food? And then I open my dishwasher, and I pull out the lasagna from my dishwasher. What are you going to do? 
You're only going to eat salad and bread that night probably, right? Why? Because a dishwasher, even though you can cook a lasagna in a dishwasher, like a dishwasher is not designed to cook a lasagna, right? It's designed to wash dishes. We have a specific design that we are called to live into, which is being in submission and surrender to God, receiving life from God and living into the life that He has for us. So freedom, true freedom, is living into God's design for your life. And Paul is saying the good news in in Romans 6 is that it's already starting to take place in your life. That grace transforms you. Grace empowers you to live into the reality for which God has designed you. He's saying it's already starting to take root in your life, and he's giving thanks for it. This is what he says in verse 17. But thanks be to God, thanks be to God, that you used to live as slaves to sin. He's saying that used to be your reality, but not anymore. Now... You have come to obey from your heart, the heart being the motivational center of your being. Paul is saying you're not following God out of obligation or manipulation. You're not trying to get something from God. You're following Him out of the desire of your heart. He says you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance, essentially saying you have a new master. You're no longer mastered by sin, but now... God is your master. Verse 18, and you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. He says, I'm using a human example, an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Which that part of verse 19 is probably a reference to this theme of slavery that he's using. He will use the term slave nine times in this passage, and using it as a reference point to talk about who is your master. Are you enslaved to sin, or are you enslaved to righteousness? Now, in our context, slavery is a negative word, right? We use it pejoratively, and it might feel weird to say that we are slaves to righteousness, slaves to obedience, or slaves to God, especially with all the stories of spiritual abuse that are starting to surface in our world. But, but Paul is essentially saying that this idea of slavery just means you belong to somebody. To, to whom do you belong? Are you slaves to righteousness or are you slaves to sin? So this is a picture of uh, the house we used to live in. Um, and, and if you can see closely, it was apparently taken when we were deciding what color to paint our front door. In the window, the top part of our house was Becky and I's bedroom. And the bathroom that we had was upstairs, and it was a straight down the hallway from our bedroom. So one day, uh, our middle child, Emma, is taking a shower, and I hear that she gets out of the shower. I was downstairs, so I go upstairs just to make sure she's doing what she's doing, supposed to be getting ready for bed. It was a nice spring night, so the windows upstairs were open. I walk upstairs, I walk down the hallway, and I see that she is wrapped in her towel, standing at that front window. The windows are open because it's nice, and she's saying something outside. And there's people, right, now it's spring, so people are walking their dogs, they're walking along the street, they're bike riding. And I hear her saying something, and I go to the doorway in our room, and I just listen, and she goes, help, help. I'm like, what? She's like, I don't live here. She says, this isn't my family. I'm like, Emma, what are you doing? And I, like, I started, she didn't know I was there, and she turned around, I'm like, what are you saying? Why are you saying this? She goes, ah, I don't know. And then she, <laughs> right? As though like we were holding her captive or something, right? Now, I would never use the terminology of my kids are being held hostage, or we're holding them captives, or they are our slaves. But if I were to use that terminology, what I would be saying is that they belong to me. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans 6. If you're slaves to sin, you're giving yourself to sin. It's as though you belong to sin. But if you're slaves to righteousness, slaves to obedience, or slaves to God, he's saying you belong to God. And what he's saying and referencing most likely is the Exodus story. Because in the Exodus story, God's people were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And God redeems them from slavery, brings them into the wilderness, gives them the law to reshape who they are 
as God's people. And he says in Exodus 19, you're no longer slaves to Pharaoh. You are now my treasured possession. So even if I were to use the terminology of slaves with my kids, which I never would, right? In the biblical context, Paul is trying to capture that you are God's treasured possession. My kids are my treasured possession. And so what he's doing here in this last part of this passage is he's showing this like then and now picture. This kind of like before and after picture. You used to live this way, but now here's what your life is like. And we see that starting in the second part of verse 19. He says, just as you used to offer yourselves, just as you used to offer yourselves, saying that was then, that's how you used to live. As you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity, And to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, again, this is what your life used to be like, you were free from the control of righteousness. Then he asks this question in verse 21, what benefit did you reap? Now, what's interesting about that word benefit, in Greek, it's the word karpon, which actually translates fruit. What fruit did you reap? Essentially asking the question, whatever you're sowing, you're reaping. So what are you sowing? It's probably the same thing that you're reaping. What benefit, what fruit did you reap at the time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. And so Paul is naming this trajectory of your old life. And he's using an agricultural metaphor. What fruit, what crop did you reap? Because he's saying whatever you sow into your life, you will ultimately reap as well. If you give yourself to sin, more sin is going to grow in your life, which sin ultimately leads, he says, to shame. What were you ashamed of? And shame leads to death. Now, we tend to think of death as this future reality in our life, right? There will come a day when my body will stop working and I will die. That day is not today, so I try and ward off death as long as I can. We think of death in terms of a physical future reality, but the Bible also talks about death as a spiritual present reality, meaning you can experience spiritual death in the here and now. Have you ever thought to yourself or heard somebody say or said out loud, I feel dead inside, right? Like you can actually experience death, spiritual death, in the here and now. And Paul is always linking, not always, but here at least, he's linking shame and death together. Shame is an understanding of self. See, sometimes we think of shame as guilt. Like, I I did something bad. But shame is different than guilt. Guilt is a negative feeling about what I've done. I've done something bad, but shame is about your understanding of who you are. I am bad. Brene Brown calls shame the swampland of the soul. And the more you live into shame and do the things that bring shame, the more you experience death in the here and now. A while back, a friend of mine was in Prague, and they happened to post a picture of their trip there. And I captured it from Facebook because it so captures this idea of shame. It's just this little picture, probably on a wall somewhere, and it says, Lately I have been frequenting bad houses, places no respectable man would be seen. I hate myself for my weakness. That's shame. Shame is when you hate yourself for your weakness. Paul, oddly enough, delights in his weakness because he knows that God's grace and his power is strong in his weakness. But for us, shame is hating ourselves in our weakness. He says, my past sickens me, right? I've been frequenting bad houses. I tell myself I will not go even as I drive there. See, sin enslaves us. Sin keeps calling us back. Sin keeps tempting us, and oftentimes, when we continue to give ourselves to sin, it creates shame in our life, and we think to ourselves, I'm awful. I am horrible. How could anybody love me? 
And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, where do you find shame surfacing in your heart? Where are you finding yourself giving in to the things that you know you shouldn't be doing? When you take your phone and you go hide away somewhere and you start to scroll on things, you're like, I know I shouldn't do this. Or you think to yourself, I'm going to go on Amazon and see what great deal is, and you know you shouldn't be buying something, and it's not just a one-time purchase, but you actually have an addiction to shopping, right? Or what if it's that, like, performance thing that you have turning over in your heart, and when you don't get the right score, when you don't get the right award, you think to yourself, I'm nobody. Or what if it's that thing you do in secret when nobody else is around? Like, like what are those things? And how do they shape how you view yourself? And what Paul is saying is that all of this is your former life. He's saying that's not who you are anymore. He's defining this in terms of who you used to be. Even though we still wrestle with this, even though we still battle this, he says that's who you used to be because as you cross into verse 22, he says, but now. That was then, but this is now. Now you have been set free. And again, freedom is living into the reality for which you were created. And so what Paul is saying through this passage is that sin binds you with shame, but God's grace sets you free. Sin binds you with shame, but God's grace sets you free specifically to be, to be free for who God has created you to be. But now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves to God. You belong to God. You are His treasured possession. And the benefit you reap, again, the fruit that you reap, leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, gift and grace, same word in Greek, the grace of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul is saying there's a different trajectory, right? If your then life was impurity, giving yourselves to impurity and sin, which led to shame, which ultimately lands in death, now he's saying you give yourself to righteousness, which leads to holiness. And sometimes we think of holiness as kind of stuffy and stoic, right? Pious, people who are reserved and morally upright. But holiness really just means to be distinct, to be set apart, that there's something noticeably different about you. And when you live that way, Paul says, what you're doing is you're experiencing eternal life. And in the same way that death not only is a physical and spiritual reality, life too is a physical and spiritual reality. Meaning I have actual physical life I can breathe in air through my lungs and exhale. My heart is beeping, blood is pumping through my veins, but it's also a spiritual reality. And Paul here says eternal life. You can experience eternal life. And sometimes we think eternal life comes my way after I die physically, and I have this quantity of life that extends forever, right? Eternal life is existence to the great beyond and forever after I die. But the Bible talks about eternal life more in terms of a quality of life, more so than a quantity of life. And perhaps it's a life that might sound a little something like this. Eternal life is a life that's about viewing salvation, not as a get-out-of-hell-free card, but a life-giving force that moves through you for the sake of the world. Eternal life is about having an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. Eternal life is having the eyes to see that there's more than enough to go around, so therefore I can be generous with everything that I have and I can leave my server an extra big tip every time I go out to eat. Eternal life is about finding joy and taking the lesser position so that I can participate in lifting someone else up. Eternal life is about believing that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available and at work and in you. Eternal life is about prioritizing creativity in the context of community over individual consumption. 
It's about having a supernatural sense of self-confidence that comes not from your performance, but a deep-seated belief that God loves you regardless of what you've done. Eternal life is about having the ability to be patient and calm when driving your car, even when somebody cuts you off on the interstate. Eternal life is about getting more angry over injustice that's in the world rather than situations where your individual preferences aren't met. Eternal life is a life that is overwhelmed by peace and contentment so that you don't have to worry about keeping up with the Joneses. It's about being able to bless and celebrate the success of someone else without feeling threatened by it. It's about waking up each morning with a renewed sense of purpose that is not wrapped up in your nine-to-five job, but it's wrapped up in being a divine image bearer of the true King of Kings. Eternal life is a life that rests in the reality that everything is going to be okay, no matter the hell you're walking through, because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Eternal life is a life of everlasting love. Anybody want that kind of life? What Paul is saying is that you have access to that life right now. Like eternal life isn't so much about a quantity of life, it's about a quality of life, and you have access to it now. Why? Because you have been set free from the power of sin and death. You have been given a new life. Life reigns in you and through you. It's available to you. And so the question is, how do I get that life? Because that's the life that I want. Well, Paul says, what are you offering yourself to? He says in verse 19, you used to offer yourself to sin. You used to offer yourself to that way of life. But now, offer yourself to Jesus. Offer yourself to righteousness. So the question is, what are you offering yourself to? What are you giving yourself to? And what if this week you did some evaluation and you actually tracked how you spend your time and you track what you're giving yourself to? I don't know if you guys have this on your cell phone, but I have this little box on my cell phone that tells me how I use my phone. Right? Today, I've used my phone for 54 minutes, which seems kind of high for a day like today. But it tells me I spent eight minutes on Safari, uh, 14 minutes on Spotify, five minutes on Facebook, seven minutes on my text messages. Anybody else have a little device like that? You, you learn a lot about your life when you start to take stock of what you give yourself to. And in the same way I have that little tracking device on my phone, what if you were to do that with your life? What if you were to look at what am I actually giving myself to and how is it shaping who I am? And then what if you started to share that with somebody who's a trusted friend and you started to say, this is what I'm learning about my life and I need somebody to kind of like journey with me through this to learn who I'm becoming because of who I'm offering myself to. Because Paul is saying, if you give yourself to sin sin will grow in your life. If you give yourself to God and His grace and His love, righteousness will grow in your life. You've been set free. You've been set free from the power of sin. Sin binds you with shame, Paul is saying, but grace sets you free. So may you see that you are no longer mastered by sin. May you see that you have a new master who is way more gracious than sin is. May you step into the freedom of who God has designed you to be. And may you experience eternal life in the here and now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who your son is that Jesus, through his death on the cross, has secured our freedom, that we are people who are no longer slaves to sin, that we are no longer mastered by sin, but we live in freedom, that we have been set free to be who you have designed us to be, people who are distinct, people who are set apart, people who are fully loved, 
so that we can love others. And so, Lord, we ask this morning that this reality would sink deep in our hearts, that we would fully embrace the life you have given us, that way we may be people who shine your glory, your light, and your love wherever we go. We pray this in your name.